Hi, look at this. Two in a row. This is the second Talking Real Money slash Sound Investing joint podcast starring Don McDonald, Paul Merriman, and Thomas C. Cock. Thank you for joining what us. What a pleasure. And I've got a lot of feedback on this uh, this this effort of ours. I think we're going to create some Have uh, you? a lot of uh, work for therapists. Yeah. <laughs> and for executives at YouTube and Google. A lot of people have been asking me, Paul, about your comment on the first one about you didn't know why you were here. They com- they, they compared it to Stockdale when he was running for vice president. I don't know if it's the same, it's the same. same but we'll go it's with it. It's the same okay. problem. All right. Just testing. <laughs> Finding out. That's all. Well, today we have a topic. We we try to pick a topic among the three of us every week. And today's topic is how do you pick funds to invest in which to invest? How do you do that? But before we get to that topic, we have an important Mm -hmm. bulletin, a huge breaking news story that is breaking as we speak and record this on the 13th of May, 2021 at uh, about noon Eastern time. Must as of mm. this very moment. Yeah, must be important. Ready? Yes. Good. Yeah. It's important. Oh, my God. Somebody found a lot of money they owe me or something. Okay. Over the weekend, we all have heard that Elon Musk, single handedly, with a three word sentence, destroyed the price of Dogecoin by saying, it's a hustle. And Dogecoin price immediately went, Pew! well, he doesn't realize the power he has. What he did. <laughs> yesterday is he came out and said, Tesla is no longer going to accept Bitcoin. Well, given the fact that you can't use your Bitcoin much of anywhere, that kind of took out much of the market for uh, Bitcoin purchases. And Bitcoin has now uh, plunged more than 23% in the last month. It's down like 9% just in one day. That means, just to put this in perspective, gentlemen, that means that if you were planning to buy a lovely self-driving Tesla Model Y a month ago, and you you had your $61,000 to buy that, in essence, one Bitcoin, now you can just barely afford the basic Model 3 with the long-range package. So now you had to go down an entire model of car in just one week. And then to make it even worse, you can't even buy it with Bitcoin anymore. You know, there's a great lesson in in this that uh, not only applies to Bitcoin, but applies to the general process of investing. And that is that the price tomorrow, next week, next year, is going to be based on the unknown. It isn't to today's information that drives the market. It's the unknown. And all of a sudden, when you have a surprise like that, because this was a coup for the Bitcoin people, the fact that uh, that they would use that with the Tesla. But the bottom line is an unexpected piece of information comes out, and it's amazing how fast the market responds. It's almost instantaneous now, Paul. Well, and I appreciate the fact that Mr. Musk isn't basing this on any economic situation, that this is because Bitcoin is not eco-friendly. So I appreciate his decision based on that, of course. And not to be cynical, but this is a great kickoff, I think, for our topic today, frankly, because when it comes to picking mutual funds or exchange-traded funds, people do have a tendency to want to get into the thing that has been successful lately, right? They have a recency bias that says, I should be in X. Don has been on the Bitcoin cryptocurrency thing for a long time because we don't think it makes sense for anybody to put their money into. That's totally good. I've always been uh, scared of things that have done well lately because uh, I'm going to steal this from you, Paul. I think you were the one who said the mountain goes like this, but then there is another side to that mountain. And generally, people have a tendency to start buying the things somewhere after the peak. (laughs) That uh, I mean, you can see ARC this year, right? This down, I think, 25 or 30 percent because it was the best or one of the best performing uh, funds last year. I think it's a great kickoff point because fads truly are 
fads. They come, they go. You got to find the things that have lasted. You mentioned that things can change quickly with a new piece of information. That's true. But stocks and bonds have over the centuries, right? Or longer uh, have have been there as investments that that continue. When you start veering off of that into these other areas or fads, that's where the trouble starts in my mind. Well, I want to make a prediction. I want to make a prediction. I'm going to make it right now, and we'll come back in a few years and see if I'm right. I predict that in two or three years, ARC will be forgotten. It will be a, 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 a footnote in the history of mutual fund investing. It'll be one of those things that somebody down the road refers back to when there's another hot fund in the market. But that being said, there are 8,000 open-ended mutual funds in America, 7,900 and change. As of the end of 2020, there are over 2,200 exchange-traded funds, and the number of those is increasing dramatically. So now we're at almost, oh, we're, we're close to, to we're over uh, 10,000 and, and pushing 11,000 investment options that are of a mutual fund style. So, Paul, how do you make sense out of that mess and pick something? Well, th there are a whole bunch of things that make a difference. And one of the challenges that the three of us have is that it, it starts with what that individual investor is trying to achieve. So if we could make up a, a, a an imaginary investor here, Don, are we talking about somebody who's looking for one fund to put in a portfolio, or are they building a portfolio of mutual funds? What's the setup? It's going to be both. Really, it's going to be both because you have people who are just getting started, putting their twenty-five or fifty dollars a month away for their, hopefully, their long-term future, and uh, they are not. They're busy at work. They've got a family to raise. They don't want to sit around managing a portfolio. And then on the other hand, you've got those who have accumulated some wealth and they're going to need a portfolio. But I think the basic question is, how do you how do you get the, the wheat from the chaff? I mean, there's a lot of chaff out there with 10,000. I think it starts with knowing what asset class you're after when you buy that mutual fund or the ETF. The, the academics tell us that the decision, the biggest decision we make is going to be the asset class that we invest in. And so if an investor is looking for large companies or small or growth or value, U.S., international, uh, there are so many to choose from. The question is, which one is going to, in fact, give them the highest probability of long-term success? And I don't think that is all that difficult. Well, but Tom, how would you even know where to begin? This is what I'm trying to get to is the basics of this. How would you even know where to begin when you're going large companies, small companies, growth stocks, value stocks, internationals, U.S., active, passive, stockbroker sold, not sold by anybody? I'm conf what if I'm sitting out here going, okay, I got a stockbroker who's telling me to buy an Oppenheimer, an Invesco Oppenheimer fund, or I've got a stockbroker telling me to buy American funds, or I've got a life insurance guy telling me to buy this fund, or I've got a financial planner who's saying I should be invested in these funds. How do I know who to believe before well, I even I get to that point? And it seems to me the starting point for most people is in their employer plan, right? They go to work, they're 22 years old, they've never saved anything, and now everybody's telling them, hey, right when you get started, you should say, I hope everybody's saying it, I certainly am, start off say, setting something aside you're never going to use, right? And get that match, get that money going. So now you got this list of, you know, in some cases it's 10 funds, in some cases it's 20. I think once, Paul, we looked at an mm -hmm. airline, I think it was Delta that had yeah. like 800. Yeah. <laughs> How in the world they pick from 800 funds? So, I mean, so I think part one is, and I'll steal this from you, Don, is the process of elimination first before picking. I'm stealing it from you. It's you your, can have it. All right. It's your work. Because we're going to eliminate anything that is not index or index-like. That is anyone, any fund 
they were, they're picking stocks. And you can identify those when you go into your employer plan because most of the time they're going to say index. They're going to reflect the S&P 500 or the Russell 2000. So you can eliminate the rest of them because they're going to be too expensive. They're going to involve somebody's picking stocks or timing markets or following what is a fad, et cetera. So that to me seems an easy one. And we all, I know, agree on that because we can't find that manager that uh, can beat the market, if you will, over a long period of time. So that's one. Then you get to, for me, you get to what Paul just said. Again, we truly as a group believe that you should own all asset classes. By the way, I find it fascinating. There's probably more funds now than there are stocks mm. in the United States, right? Because I don't think there's that many yeah. publicly traded stocks. So a lot there of aren't. There about, well, it's about 8,800 publicly traded stocks that are of a, a sufficient market capital to be in a, a total market index. And we have 10,000 200 funds. We can get you in some nice penny stocks that might own a uh, a deli of some kind if you want. Oh, but, the uh, deli, yeah. The deli I always one. wanted to own a <laughs> own, own a billion dollar deli. So then we're going I mean so this you get into the nuts and bolts a little bit because you made a very good point Don a moment ago. And that is for someone starting out, can they pick the five funds that cover all these asset classes? Can they build the portfolio in the right percentages so that you have some value in there and you got some small and international. For most people, that's A, too much time, B, too much sophistication, and C, no offense, it, it the rebalancing part is tricky. Well, I, let me ask you both yeah. a question, though. Before we even get to the rebalancing and the management and all that, you raised an important point, Tom. The vast majority of investing for retirement in this country occurs within employer-sponsored plans. 401ks, 403bs, 457, and the like. However, in many, 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 many cases, and this is, this is particularly true of healthcare and education, the options provided aren't just limited, they're often atrocious. In some cases, the only thing that employers are ever told to buy in these plans, Paul, is a, is an annuity. Now, un unfortunately, there's a long tradition in those particular industries. Uh, I don't want to say to screw people, but but to focus on the payment and the returns to the salesperson rather than the investor. That is changing, though. That is truly changing. Uh, teachers are starting to fight back, and I don't know about the healthcare industry, but it is finally happening that at almost every level. Tom brought it up, expenses. And the expenses are the one thing, low expenses I'm talking about, that are dependable. Right, right. <laughs> not, not high ones. You're going to have it right. there forever. And, and I've, I've been fighting to try to find every half a percent advantage to investors. And the expense is the, it's a slam dunk. And where does that come from at the, the lowest levels? Again, the index fund. And, and, and so I, I think it is fairly easy to narrow this down to a handful of companies, but you still need to understand the risk that you're taking. And the question becomes, do you put all of your money in equities, which is what the three of us would probably recommend to a young investor, or do you add some fixed income, some Add some break to the gas, if you if you will, and kind of slow the volatility down. Those are huge questions. But the bottom line is expenses in fixed income or equities, uh, diversification, these things that index funds give you, they are just not found in the other part of the industry. Let's stick with that point the fee point for a moment, because it is so important and so often horribly overlooked. And we know that from the business that we've been in for a very long time, which is managing people's money, Tom. The, the You even recently saw an example of a fixed income fund, a bond fund from a large, well-known, I mean, gigantic, well-known mutual fund company, the American Funds Group, that charged more than 1% per year to manage a bond portfolio. Yeah, I think the, I think the expense ratio is 1.3 and the yield was 1.1. Mm -hmm. Just to add that up, you can see that we're not headed in the right direction there. 
Um, so, okay. So, but that goes back to picking the right funds. That's again, why index or index like funds eliminate everything else. That's easy. I'm going to go back though, to make things simple, because I think Paul, you've had a great idea here for many years that makes sense. And I'm going to finally agree with you after 25 years. I hope that's not too shocking, but here's the thing. Um, It'll happen to me eventually. I'm counting on it, Paul. Here's, here's the thing for most people getting started using the uh, target date fund, plus hopefully a small or small cap value fund. That's going to work. Wait, wait, that's going to work. Paul's book. I know. What did you do? I, I you, read you every once in a while. You just synopsized Paul's book. There's no need to buy Paul's book anymore. You just gave away the ending. I'm sorry. Spoiler alert. Now, I'll send him a good a good copy of a novel or something, so he's got something else to look forward to the end. No, I mean, again, I think simplicity. And this gets back to, again, when I look, because I get to look at, you know, five new portfolios a week. It's the great part of my job. People come in. Mm. What do you think? And most people have way too many funds. Most people buy, you know, from it's like going to the cafeteria. I'll have hot fudge ice cream. I'll have, and they pile all this up on their cart and they think they're doing the right thing because, wow, it sure tastes good and I paid for it. But the fact is, most people should be subtracting funds from their portfolio, not adding to them. We talked about this on our show recently that, again, people have a tendency that, well, I got to add that because that's, that's new and that's cool. I got to add that. And let me give you an example. I think it's fascinating. And this just came out yesterday in an industry publication that the three of us are familiar with. Here are five, I'll give four funds I would never own. The Breakwave Dry Bulk Shipping ETF, the Amplify <laughs> Amplify Seymour <laughs> Cannabis ETF, uh, the Global X Cannabis ETF, and the Amplify Transformational Data Sharing ETF. Now, how do I even know those names? Those I, I are the know. top four, the biggest returns in Q1. And this is the kind of thing that, that, our industry sends to each other and said, Hey, you got to pay attention to this. Look at that return. The, the break wave drive again, the break wave the- dry bulk shipping ETF was up 111, per, pardon me, 112% in the first three months of the year. Okay. But here's an important that. question, Tom, is there a wet bulk <laughs> shipping ETF? Well, it's a lot heavier. And it, it right, may, it may go, I think it, the margins it, might be better. It may go down as quickly as the ARC fund you were ter- referred to earlier. I don't know. I'm you just did. saying that. So subtraction most of the time, I think, is very important. Simplicity and low cost. Again, people have a tendency to, they don't know. So they, again, pick a lot of funds, and that is not diversification. By the way, generally it turns out that most of those funds own the same thing, which are large mm. U.S. growth firms, preferably st- a tech because that's been the place to be the last few years, correct? Yeah. Well, I, I think that we have to keep in mind that the industry is not paid for telling the whole story. Uh, and if you had the whole story, and that's what we're really looking for, understanding all of those things that are going to impact our bottom line. And a great example of this is the tax impact. I don't know of a mutual fund prospectus that says the tax impact based on the maximum highest tax bracket is going to be X, uh, 1%, 2% uh, lower because of the taxes you're going to have to pay. And what we know is, and it's on Morningstar, you can see it. We know, for example, that the S&P 500 if you look at its long-term return, has about a half a percent loss to taxes based on paying the highest tax rate. On the other hand, the average mutual fund in the same category is one and a half percent lost to taxes, which means a lot of funds out there are reporting their return like this is a great return without saying, but just make sure you understand that a lot of the money you're going to make on our fund, it's going to be taxed away. And that is something you can control. And you brought it up, Tom, index funds control that tax implication. Again, it seems, though, that we are coming back to the same issue. The thing that makes a great mutual fund is how much it saves you as opposed to how much it makes you. We're saying low-fee funds, 
make you will make you more money in aggregate than a comparable higher fee fund. Low tax implication funds will make you more money in aggregate than a higher tax implication fund. So shouldn't be, that maybe be where we put our focus when trying to pick a fund? Well, Again, yeah, I'm yeah. going to cut in here, Paul. Yeah, I, I again, I would a process of elimination. I would eliminate all the ones that were tax inefficient, especially if they're held outside of a IRA or 401k. I would eliminate anything that had an expense ratio north of forty basis points, fifty. I mean, I don't Any know where more, you're going to draw. The, I mean, the, Any to, more it's world. thirty. I think. And I would eliminate anything that really basically didn't hold uh, REITs, stocks, or bonds. Again, I think you start getting into speculative areas where people think, I just read about land easement mm. fund or something where people said, oh, I lost all my money. Yeah, because <laughs> that's a very speculative type of venture that I wouldn't do. And then I would go back to what Paul said, the strategy. I just read a piece uh, when I was doing a little research on this from Kiplinger's written a few years ago, and they interviewed a young man who said, to be honest, I don't think I had much of a strategy at all. I just picked funds. And this is what people have a tendency, and you laugh at the bulk, dry, whatever it was, ETF, but people will buy it because it went up 112%, and I got to have some of that in there. So elimination, low cost, tax efficiency is certainly very, very important. But here's my question to, to the two of you. At what point do we then say, well, okay, Index funds are okay, but we got something just a little bit better. It's And it may cost you a little bit more. For example, like a dimensional funds, or if you really want to get out there, how about AQR? Something that's a little more special than an index fund. How should people decide between just being true indexers and adding a little bit of cayenne to those eggs just to turn up the heat a little bit? Well, I, I think it usually... Uh, that extra heat is coming from the asset class you're adding. The three of us are fans of small cap, but small cap funds and stocks come in a lot of different sizes. You can get a small cap fund that the average size of the company is $4 billion. You can get another one that the average size of the company is $1.5 billion. And some of those, call them outliers if you wish, the same with value, deeply discounted value as opposed to modestly discounted value, that can cost the manager additional money. And, and so I think you have to look at the return, the extra premium you're going to get from these managers who are trying to get to asset classes that are likely to create a bigger return. But let's be really clear about the reality of asset classes that have historically shown a tendency to provide higher returns. They also have one other important consideration that isn't mentioned a lot and needs, I believe, needs to be heavily emph emphasized. Risk. Well... They're gonna they're gonna have more volatility. You know, that's that is true, but I think there's even a, a bigger challenge with these asset classes that uh, that they, they offer extra return opportunity. They can be out of favor for a very long time, and when you do take extra risk and you don't get the return now, you start to get impatient. You might even get impatient after five years. Well, you might even find that you will be impatient after 20 years. But literally, there are times in history, like, for example, small cap value, underperformed the S&P 500 for 20 years. And the academics will respond by saying, well, you're not very patient, are you? But that's the problem with some of these outliers. You've got to have time on your side or just be a big believer in owning those asset classes. Time doesn't do me much good because I don't have much time. I want those premiums now. Now, I know I might not get them, but I'm willing to hold those kinds of asset classes thinking there's a chance that I'll get it. If not, my heirs will get it. But you've got to be very patient with those kind of 
Yes, but, but Paul, that patience can be worn thin very quickly. And, and, and what people hear is they hear that small cap value has over long periods of time outperformed everything else in the equity markets. However, what the experts say is that small cap value has outperformed growth, small cap growth, 80, 90% of the time over 20 year periods. But that still leaves 10 where it doesn't. And that 10 is where people often actually find themselves. And how do you how do you address that fear? Or should it be that we just leave that out entirely if we're if there's that possibility we might panic in a 20 year you time? Know, I think it's a matter of how much you have in the portfolio. Because we have recommended, and you have too, I'm sure, relatively small amounts of small cap value. Uh, in fact, in that in our book, we're talking millions. We do talk about taking a target date fund and adding just 10% small cap value, and that's a that actually can be a life changer over a lifetime, and not so much that you feel like you're counting on one thing to get you where you're trying to go. You know, and this always gets back to um, belief. What do you believe? Who do you believe? And at the end of the day, everybody has to decide. I mean, in some ways, and I know I'll make this political, it's got to be a Republican or Democrat in this country, right? Or some other small, but you got to know what you believe. If you truly believe that you can find somebody or have found somebody that can pick stocks and beat the market. I say, God bless you. That's great. You know, call me in 10 really? years. Uh, no, no, well. no, 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 no. Hold I, on. Wait a yeah. minute. I got to, I got to challenge you on that. Okay. You really believe that if somebody just believes something that you should leave them to their fantasy belief? Well, I, I will do my best to dissuade you of that belief, but at some point people have to decide. We have decided that we trust academic work. We have decided that we trust looking at the numbers over a long period of time, knowing that there will be 10 year periods like we just went through where the two asset classes that Paul just mentioned, small and value will underperform greatly. It would have been way, way, way more sense to just be in the S&P 500, but I believe this to my core. I do. I may die believing it and hoping that it works out for my heirs, but that's, that's something every person has to decide. There's all kinds of, I think, work that you can trust. Your work, Paul, the academic work, Larry Swedro, others out there that you can read and say, yeah, this makes sense. I'm going to follow this because I believe and trust it. Once you've done that, then the rest becomes very, very easy. Picking the right funds, therefore, pretty simple in today's world because you can go really sophisticated as you've done Paul on your website where you can get terrific 10 fund portfolios at all those uh, big custodians we've got simpler ones at ours because we think most people just three funds it's you know big or pardon me US international and bonds is enough but um, once you've made that decision life gets simpler i think and you can also tune out the bulk wave bulk whatever dry etf because you don't need to add on. And your life just, I think, it's, is, is much easier from that point forward. Okay, let's make it real simple to end this, to conclude this episode. Paul, what is the best advice you can give someone who is looking to buy a mutual fund or two or 10 today for their long-term future? Find the funds that represent the things that you want to to control, that you know you can control and not just count on some sort of a random outcome. Those controls would be around expenses, whether you're buying a fund or, or, or the operating expense of the fund. Look at tax implications. You want massive diversification. Anywhere you can find additional diversification, I think that's where you should be going. Make sure there's no penalty to get in, to get out, and that that fund is within your risk tolerance. Know yourself, know the investment process, which is why we wrote We're Talking Millions. And by the way, Don, you suggest 
He said no, one thing. You one said, thing. Come on. No, I didn't. I just <laughs> said conclude. No, no, you no, suggested, no, no. He took you everything. You suggested that people wouldn't have to buy our book uh, in order to learn this stuff because you've given it all away right here. Tom but gave the it all book away. is yeah. available it all free. Away. There's a free PDF. You don't have to spend a dime. Wow, we're talking millions plus another nine. <laughs> whatever bucks happened or to something. whatever happened to the audio version with oh Don McDonald? Is that we now cannot available? figure out what Don that... said that Audible will not release it. <laughs> I get that it. every Saturday. <laughs> oh, oh, okay, not again. We're Are still waiting. I mean, it's a, it's. Oh my God! I mean, YouTube is after me. Audible's at, what do I what what? I am not. I am. I. I'm. I, I'm not a radical. I'm not violent. I'm may not I suggest, bad. I'm may a I nice person. You start talking nicely yes. about stockbrokers, mm -hmm. and maybe your future will change. Nope. I, I knew nope. it. I knew nope. it. Nope. Nope. Not gonna. Not gonna say nice things about stockbrokers or insurance agents who sell investment products. Never going to happen. Well, let I'll me give go you to my, my let grave. Me give you my it'll rules. say Don slammed. Stockbrokers and life insurance agents, and never regretted it. Go ahead, Tom. Let me see, let me tell you the things that I see. Again, most of the time, I see people that have too many funds, not too few. Most of the time, people have a huge bias to wanting to just invest in the United States because I live here, I know it, my parents lived here, et cetera, et cetera. That those two are the two biggest. And I will say about global diversification, yes. It has been far better to have all of your money invested in the United States the last 10 years. But my suggestion would go back and look at the 10 years prior to that. Go back and look at the 50 years prior to that. It's been better to be global. Number two around that. If you think it makes sense to focus on one country, I, I you can very go, easily go back and look at Japan in 1990. And the Nikkei from that point to today is still lower. Why? Well, I don't know all the reasons. Liar loans with banks, whatever. But most people in Japan have their money invested in Japan. Most people in the United States have their money invested here because they trust it. You shouldn't. You should be globally diversified. We have no idea where the big growth, the big ideas, the big economy, economics will happen over the next 20 to 30 years. I'm spreading my money around. I love the United States, but most people do not do that. They should be globally invested from this point forward if you're not already. I'll put it that way. Let me conclude by saying no broker sold mutual funds ever. <laughs> there goes the love, man. We'll never get that. No out. A shares, <laughs> no B shares, no C yeah. shares. Because when somebody tries to sell you a C share, that is a broker telling you the ultimate lie, pretending they sell no load funds in the, in the shape of a fund that pays them a big fat commission. Ask them how much they get paid. And if they say nothing or the company pays me, please immediately leave their office because they are lying to you. You need to know how everybody's paid. You need to avoid actively managed mutual funds because they tend to be more expensive. You need an expense ratio of way below 0.5% on your mutual funds. As a matter of fact, I just looked at the Vanguard small cap value fund, which should be an expensive fund because it's dealing with small companies and value, but it's an index, so it's only seven one-hundredths of 1% 1 per year. That's all. And finally, all the little things are important, but finally, the ultimate advice I can give you is just do it. If that means you just go out and you buy the Vanguard Total World Stock ETF, VT, for a fraction of nothing, and you buy it through a discount broker so you don't have any commissions or sales charges, do that. At least you're doing something. And keep doing it. Maintain the discipline. That's it. Good advice. Well, Thank said. you, gentlemen. Thank you all for being a part of this. We're going to do it again in a couple of weeks, as long as YouTube doesn't kick us off again. And uh, I swear it was you guys, because you know I usually get stuff up there. I think it was both of you. No, Paul gets stuff up there too. Oh, wait. Who's the one person who doesn't oh, have a yeah, lot of uh oh? Yeah. I know. I now I'm now suspecting who we can blame. It's I'll the take empty it. chair. It's yeah. the empty chair. See you guys soon. The famous empty chair. Paul, have a great yep. one, Tom. 
Best of luck to you. I'm sure I'll be talking to you again in 30 or 40 seconds. And all of you, thanks so much for being a part of our podcast, our video cast, all the casts. Remember, if you have questions for Paul, it's paul at paulmerriman.com. If you have any questions for us, just go to talkingrealmoney.com and uh, use the contact form and listen to both of our podcasts. Tom's, uh, Paul's podcast is Sound Investing. Tom's and Don's podcast is Talking Real Money. Thanks again. Tell a friend or two or 10. We'll talk to you really soon.